Welcome to the January 30, 2009 edition of the Open Forum. Again, we have the privilege and the pleasure, and it's a distinct privilege and pleasure, to open our Bibles with you and look at this verse and that verse, trying to discover truth. Because truth is in the Bible. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The Bible says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That Word is the Lord Jesus Christ, and that Word is the Bible. In other words, the Bible is totally, the whole Bible is totally identified with the Lord Jesus, who is eternal God. Where therefore, we can say very accurately that every word in the original languages of the Bible came right from the mouth of God. In fact, God gives us an illustration of how he did this back in the book of Jeremiah, one of the most awesome and difficult books of the Bible, but showing that this is the way the Bible was written. All this difficult language, all of these uh, warnings, all of these uh, prophecies and and uh, difficult uh, questions that could arise came from the mouth of God. And therefore, we know that when we can spend an hour and a half together looking at this verse and that verse, we're not playing around. We're not wasting our time. We're not just uh, filling in some time. We're not reading a casual book or a book that just is kind of interesting and maybe a little bit significant for our day. No way. No way. We are dealing with the most profound and important and awesome book that has ever, ever been given to the human race. It stands absolutely unique and alone. And how wonderful it is that we can have this kind of a time together. Well, this is your program. We want to hear from you. And so, shall we take our first call tonight? Uh, welcome to Open Forum. What question do you have? Uh, Brother Camping? Yes. Uh, yes, I'm calling from nor uh, northern New Jersey. <laughs> And I'm getting the uh, TV signal over here, and it's, and it's, gr and it's a great thing. I have, um, uh, the other night, uh, or two nights ago, uh, someone asked you, or didn't ask you, but he said that you were arrogant. Yeah. And I have uh, two verses, uh, Colossians 4, 3. Colossians chapter 4. Verse 3, let's look at that. Colossians chapter 4, verse 3. There we read with, okay, well, let's start with verse 2. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving, with all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds, that I may, may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Yes, and I also have another verse, Matthew 5, 37. Matthew chapter 5, verse 37. There we read... But let your communication be yes, yes, no, no, for whatever is more than these cometh of evil. Yes, and I'd like you to comment on um, um, the way the gospel needs to be presented is exactly the way you are doing it. So if you can comment on that. Well, yes. In other words, we our task is to make a faithful presentation of the gospel uh, we uh, we uh, uh, in order to do that it means first of all we have to do our homework in the gospel uh, so that we are 
uh, careful uh, to uh, what we are teaching, that it will be faithful to the Word of God, then, to our horror, <laughs> oftentimes we find that what we've learned from the Bible is pretty awful. It is, uh, it is saying ugly things to the human race. And uh, then we're really up against it. What are we going to do? You know, by nature, uh, we, uh, we all like to look uh, uh, quite, uh, 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 quite um, uh, acceptable in the eyes of our fellow man. Uh, we don't like to come with bad news, but this, uh, this is not the way we can bring the gospel. We have to be a faithful uh, presenter of what we learn from the gospel, even though it may be ugly news in the eyes or the ears of those who are hearing it. They may not like it at all. And as a consequence that they don't like what you're teaching, they don't like you either. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's the risk that we take as we faithfully declare the Word of God. We cannot camouflage the truth. We cannot set it aside. We cannot make good look like, or bad look like it's good. We have to teach it exactly as it is. And if we are uh, have uh, rotten eggs thrown at us or, or bad tomatoes thrown at us, so be it. We, that's, that's, the, that's what has to happen. We have to be faithful to what we are teaching because we do not teach to please men or women. We teach to please God. God has given us the Bible for the good of mankind, but in so doing, he, has t he tells us a great many things that we don't like to hear at all, but they, these things must be presented straight from the shoulder without any uh, uh, cover-up or, or trying to make it less than it really is. But thank you for sharing those verses, which are an encouragement to any of us who are trying to bring the truth. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, good evening. Uh, I wanted to go over a couple verses, but I want to I want to make a, a comment because I'm sure when we go over these verses, the same thing is going to happen that always happens. I greatly appreciate the fact that you have been the front runner on preaching the Lord's coming and that judgment's coming, and that for that you need to be credited. Although that credit goes to the Lord Himself. However, as much as you talk a lot about how you believe, and I want to go over a couple verses to prove this. As much as you talk a lot about how your authority is the Bible. The fact of the matter is you really are a very, very unapproachable, unteachable, uncorrectable individual, and you also think you're all-knowing. Because when you've been called upon, where you've been given hard and fast biblical evidence regarding certain things, you are very short and rude, and you terminate the call, even when you've been proven wrong and you fail to look at when you've been proven wrong, and the fact of the matter is you've been wrong in the past on some major issues like getting out of the churches, which you thought people were going to come out in droves, and this is your approach. For somebody that's your age with the amount of years you've been studying the Bible, you really are a very, very immature spiritual individual. Well, and now, I'm gonna, excuse I'm me. Now, excuse me. Uh, that's, uh, you can say all those things, and that doesn't really trouble me at all, because that's your take on it. That's what you perceive. Uh, but the fact is that because I want to be faithful to the Word of God, I do not uh, hesitate to admit when I have been wrong. Tell me, how many preachers... Uh, who have you ever heard that from time to time from the pulpit would say, you know, during the past five years or ten years or twenty years, I was teaching thus and so, and I was dead wrong. I was wrong, and now God has corrected me. How often have you heard that? And yet, if if we're going to be a faithful teacher, we we the Bible itself says it's given to us for correction, and we're, we there will come times when we have to admit 
we are wrong. Now, that's, that's, that doesn't go very well with pride, you know. That, uh, that, uh, nobody really likes to admit that. Uh, and uh, secondly, if, if someone begins to uh, develop a verse, and it's very obvious to me that they do not understand that verse, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this program. This is a teaching program. And you can say, well, you're just teaching what camping finds. Right. No, I teach whatever the Bible shows us, right. and I learn from our listeners just as well as when I study myself. Okay, yeah. can we go over some verses? Can we go? Can we over? I want to go over a verse. Right. I, want to what, give, what? I want to give an example right here. One All quick right. verse. All right. Here's Zechariah three one. And I don't know if you're familiar with this, but I've done a very in-depth analysis of this. The word right hand actually means place of honor. That's what right hand means. Now, you are going to teach, and you've been teaching, and you're going to stick to your guns on this, and this is going to prove what I'm talking about. You're going to teach that a literal Satan is sitting in heaven at God's right hand when that is impossible. The word right hand means honor. The Satan that you claim is an evil entity would not be able to sit in a place of honor in heaven, but that's what you teach because you're failing to look at the original well, actually, language. And now, let me actually, say this now, about excuse this me, Excuse me. Now, I have never, never taught this verse. You have never heard me teaching this verse, even as you read it. Uh, and he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. I, I, I did get into the, the, uh, the, uh, a little bit further where it talks about the, uh, may, uh, uh, the, the, uh, how did he put it, uh, uh, where Satan says, may the Lord rebuke thee. Uh, I think that this passage ties in with, with Jude. But this particular verse, I have never, never said that uh, what it meant that Satan's standing at his right hand. But, the, but, and you say that it means in a place of honor. That may be true or may not be true. That would have to be studied all through the Bible to make sure that, that you have a correct take on that. You may or you may not have. But the fact is, uh, the, uh, Satan has been appointed by God, and we can't deny this. He has been appointed by God to rule over the churches. Uh, and we read, the, we read this, for example, in Ezekiel chapter 29. In Ezekiel 29, where we read that, that, and whether we want to call that a place of honor or not, that's uh, it's, it's certainly a, a something, quite something that he does, has been appointed. Uh, we read in a, a, Ezekiel 29, verse 18, Son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he is, of course, typifying Satan. That is found re, uh, in Isaiah 14 and so on. Uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, caused his army to serve a great service against Tyre. Uh, and that, Tyre, that service is against the world, as, and particularly against the churches. Every head was made bald, and every shoulder was peeled. Yet he had no wages, nor his army, for Tyre, for the service that he had served against it. Therefore, thus saith, the Lord Jehovah, behold, I will give the land of Egypt unto Nebuchadnezzar. Now, what does the land of Egypt have to do with it? Well, remember that in in uh, Revelation 11, the uh, the uh, two witnesses lie in the streets of the city where the Lord was crucified, which is called Sodom and Egypt, and uh, God frequently uses the. Uh, Egypt as a figure of all the churches. I will give the land of Egypt unto Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall take her multitude, and take her spoil, and take her prey, and it shall be 
the wages for his army. I have given him the land of Egypt for his labor, wherewith he served against it, because they wrought for me, saith the Lord Jehovah. Now, we, we don't like this kind of language, but I'll tell you, this is what God is teaching, and it, and it fits perfectly into what the Bible teaches about the fact that throughout the great tribulation period of of uh, 23 years, Satan was given the rule over the churches as well as extent, uh, additional rule within the whole world. Now, you, uh, we don't. This is language we don't like to read about. We don't like to uh, to see it. But nevertheless, it is there. Now, coming back again to your assertion that. I, I'm only teaching what uh, what I find. No, I learn some of these things. I learn some of these things others learn, and I learn from them. Uh, but I test them before I'm going to teach them. I test them for myself. Now, I have not tested your question about uh, uh, the right hand being a place of honor. That I, although I do know. Uh, you, it may be uh, you may be correct because we do find that Christ was seated at the right hand of God when He ascended into heaven. Uh, that is, He is ruling over and was given rule over everything. And you may be accurate on that. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, hi, Mr. Camping. Um, I have a I went over the road truck driver, and I, as I go through the different states in this country, I hear a lot of different um, Bible teachers and preachers and ministers um, on the radio. And I heard one of them, he was saying something about, um, like, you know how he said that the Holy Spirit was taken out of the churches? Well, this one preacher was saying God doesn't put the... I have another question too. God does. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get your question yet. You yeah. said that there, um, someone was teaching that God, God. God doesn't put the Holy Spirit in a building; He puts it in the people. Can you respond on that? That God doesn't put the Holy Spirit in, in a building. Of course, He doesn't put it in the Holy Spirit in buildings. The church is not a building. Uh, that chief preacher was correct about that. The 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 uh, the congregate the body of believers is the is the kingdom of God that the church is supposed to represent. Or let's say it the other way: the church is the people, not the building. You can be a church up by the riverside, you don't, or under a tree. You don't have to have a building. And um, okay, and your book Adam when that. You that Edwin Edwin Seal, I think his name is. You you did a he did a study on the uh, the date of Solomon's temple at forty nine ninety. You know what I'm talking about? Well, the uh, I, I'm acquainted with Edwin uh, Thiele. He was uh, yeah. he was a pastor. Uh, I don't know if he's still alive or not, but I know in years past. He, I think he had a, ch a church or a congregation in Texas, maybe. Um, I could be wrong about that. Uh, and he really believed he was an expert in the Greek language. I do remember that. But on the other hand, uh, the, uh, the, when it came to dating, uh, until you work through, uh, like, for example, when you talk about the date of Solomon's temple, uh, that uh, in order to date that or, or uh, date Solomon or date David or anybody else, you have to date all the kings of Judah and Israel. And that has not been done by Dr. Thiele or anybody else. Uh, I've, I've been quite familiar with what has been available, and it has, and there's never, never been a complete a harmony found between all of those dates, although, although uh, uh, later on, our, this was we were able to show that we could date everything very accurately. Uh, how do you, how did you start? Like, where did you start your timeline to refer it back into the Bible? 
Well, you have to start from the beginning, of course. I still remember 50 years ago uh, staring at Genesis 5 and Genesis 10 uh, uh, where you have all so-and-so was so old and begat so, uh, someone else and uh, son and wondering what are what are all these figures representing or what how do we tie this together? You have to start at the beginning. And the first date, that came to my attention. It was after five years of very intensive study and and uh, prayer and comparing Scripture with Scripture uh, constantly. Uh, finally, I began to see that creation, when we tied into our calendar, was in the year 11,013 B.C. All right, that acted then as a starting date. And then everything had to start working out from there. And after a while, uh, after some more years of study, I finally learned that the flood occurred in the year 4990 B.C. And then that David ascended the throne in 1007 B.C. And uh, that uh, uh, Judah was destroyed in the fi year 587 B.C. Or most of the the literature that's available by the theologians say 586 B.C., but that's incorrect. It will not factor in to all the other dates of the Bible. It's 587 B.C., and, uh, the, and so on and so on. Okay. Have a good evening, Brother Campy. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Camping. How are you tonight? I'm very well, thank you. Um, in Proverbs 9, uh, verse 8, how do you know if it's a wise man or if he's a scorner? How, when it says, rebuke not a, a scorner, how do you know if he's, he's a wise man or not? Proverbs 9, verse 8, reprove mm -hmm. not a scorner, lest he hate thee, rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. Well, I, <laughs> I, I, what was your question now? How, when, 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 when you're, how do you decide whether to, you know, rebuke somebody or not? Because who's the wise? The Bible says well, who is they, wise. You they, know, who, you nobody. See, you, know. you see, in 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 the Book of Proverbs, particularly, but all through the Bible. The idea of a wise man is someone who is a child of God. And a child of God recognizes, I don't know anything in myself. I, I want to listen only to what God teaches me. And if a rebuke comes to a child of God, based on the scriptures, he will th be thankful for that rebuke because he has only one desire, and that is to be true and trustworthy in the Word of God and in his lifestyle, and so on. And so he will, he will, <clears throat> he will welcome that rebuke. But on the other hand, if someone is mocking the Bible and scorning the Bible, and you say, and you rebuke him and say, you know, sir, you know what the Bible says about what your action is or, or what you're teaching and so on. Uh, they don't like that. They will, they will hate you. They will say, they will uh, think that uh, you're a wise guy and you're, you're just trying to put them down. And so that's, that's what, uh, in other words, if, if we're truly a child of God and, and walking very humbly, we welcome when we have been corrected. But the correction has to come not because of someone's, what somebody's church is teaching or what someone thinks to be the truth. It has to come faithfully from the Word of God. And then that, that uh, correction is welcome, believe you me. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Hi. Yes. I was listening, and a few callers ago, he challenged you, and exactly what he was saying was very correct. You cut him off 
and you kept going on and on and on and on, and you didn't let you, you didn't even let him finish what he was saying. How do you respond to that? Well, I, I'm sorry, I responded and spoke for a bit in answering his uh, accusation, and then I waited a moment, and maybe I should have waited a little longer, and we went to the next call. I thought that he, I thought he had hung up, or that we had lost him. But okay, I, well, I have one question. I'm my, my question, my question, hello? My question is, as Christians, shouldn't we be able to open the Bible up and teach and show from the Bible? But yet, you can't show any one of us listening where is the date you said. Sure. Well, can you... No, I'm not claiming. I'm not claiming to know the well, date. No, wait a minute. Excuse me. I'm going to answer your question. You've asked me a question. Shouldn't we be able to show from the Bible about May 21, 2011? Yes. And, and yes, this we is should. What, excuse me. This is exactly what we've done. Exactly. Okay. But well, then can you show me, us that? Excuse me. But you would like to see it as a sentence that someplace in the Bible it says in the year 2011. Tell me. Tell me, if you look at the theological books that have been written, how many volumes have been written by skilled uh, theologians from various denominations concerning the nature of the uh, Eucharist or the nature of but, the Lord's table? Uh, hello? Excuse me. Now, why is but it... But the, the difference is that you're setting a date and you're not showing it. Well, no, wait, wait a minute. Is is, is the, the, the when a church teaches any doctrine, I use the Eucharist or the Lord's table as an illustration. I could teach or the nature of salvation. Uh, there's a, a, a whole lot of doctrines, and there have been extensive books written about these various doctrines. Why? Why, if, if a church, if a theologian was so certain about what the meaning of the Lord's table is, why can't he just show uh, two or three sentences in the Bible and that does it, that cleans it up, it's all done? Well, the reason he can't is because that's the way God wrote the Bible. We have to compare Scripture with Scripture and, and in order to come to truth. I'll finish talking about this right after this message. We're talking about how to show truth from the Bible. And we would like to have everything just laid out and, and so one can say, well, here, here it says in Ezekiel 19, verse 22, that Christ is going to return, the rapture is going to happen on May 21, 2011. We'd like to have it that way. The Bible was not written that way. Uh, the Bible was written so that God gives a little information here and a little bit of information there, and we have to we have to very prayerfully and carefully tie these things together. And then, if we are on the right track, God will show us proofs that indeed this did happen. Think, for example, of the raising of the Lord Jesus. The disciples had a terrible time with that, even though they were living there, right there. They saw the empty tomb. And right afterwards, they couldn't, they didn't believe it. They, they were having a terrible time with it. And then God em emphasizes in the book of Acts chapter 1 that God gave many proofs to prove that he had indeed risen. And this, this is for the benefit of people that were living right there in Jerusalem. They saw him crucified. They saw him taken off the cross. They saw him put in the tomb. They saw the empty tomb. And yet they still didn't believe. This is how difficult it is for people to assimilate truth from God. All right. Now, however... Uh, for example, we find that uh, just as the kind of proofs that God gives us, isn't it amazing? 
that when we read Genesis chapter 6, the biblical date for the closing of the door of the ark, which meant that nobody else could get into the ark, and that was the date the flood waters began, was on the 17th day of the second month of the of the uh, the biblical calendar that was in, employed in that day. Now, isn't it interesting that uh, developing all of this information from uh, all kinds of information in the Bible, and then we find a proof which had nothing to do with the developing development of the information that May 21, 2011 is the 17th day of the second month of the biblical calendar that was initiated at, uh, at the time that Israel left Egypt in 1447 B.C. And you can check that against uh, any Jewish calendar because they do follow uh, the biblical calendar and exactly the same date. And then when we find that these two dates are 7,000 years apart. Uh, uh, the fact one date was in the year 4990 B.C. and completely independent from that knowledge of 7,000 years, the year 2011 was arrived at. And when we, when we compare those two numbers, we find they were exactly 7,000 years apart. And God said in Second Peter chapter 3, Beloved, there's one thing I want you to know. And he, he is, was talking there about the flood of Noah's day. He was talking about the, uh, the destruction of the world by fire uh, on the last day. And in that context, he says, Beloved, there's one thing I want you not to be ignorant of. A day is as a thousand years. Well, we ponder that a little bit. We look at what Noah was told. In seven days, you get into the ark, Noah, because in seven days, the whole world is going to be destroyed. The floodwaters are going to begin. All right, let's, let's uh, take the clue from Second Peter chapter 3. In 7,000 years, a day is a 1,000 years, we have to get into the security of the Lord Jesus Christ because the ark typified the security of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's only in Him that we can escape the destruction that is coming upon the world. And lo and behold, exactly 7,000 years later, we find that the uh, we, we get to the year 2011. On the 17th day of the second month of the biblical calendar that we have today, even as it was the 17th day of the second month of the biblical calendar that was utilized in the day of Noah. Now, did that? how did all that come to pass? Was that just accidental or coincidental? No way. These are the kind of proofs that God has given us to show us that indeed our homework has been done correctly. Now, we're not, again, we have said it again and again, and I wish those who are, uh, are so upset about this would please call or write for uh, Family Radio for the book. We're almost there. It's all laid out how these dates were arrived at. Uh, so you can check it out for yourself, whether we were faithful to the Word of God. You know, we're living in a day, while we're on this subject, we're living in a day, we, everybody knows there's an end of the world coming. Everybody knows that. Uh, even the atheists, may, they may try to act like they don't, but deep in their heart, they know that. That's because God's law is written on man's heart. And, and uh, there have been those who have tried to speculate when it would be. There are people who have been reading the Bible trying to speculate. And, uh, and uh, they've always been wrong. Everybody's been wrong. But by the same token, if you look at 
where, when they did speculate and look at the uh, biblical rationale, if they claimed to have a biblical basis for it, you'd find that it was enormously defective. It, it did not take into account all kinds of information in the Bible. And, and so now we come along with a date, and we know there has to be an end time date, uh, and we show a very, very careful biblical rationale with plenty of proofs. And think about it. What a marvelous illustration of the love of God. What if he, if suddenly it was the last day and we had no warning? How terrible that would be. But here is God giving us a, a couple of years, actually three years. We've already had this information for about a year. Three years warning. Uh, that we are right at the end and giving all the detail. What a loving God that he would do this. And uh, this is because God does, has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He has no pleasure at all. And, uh, and uh, that's why right up until the end, God has got a, a salvation program going so that right today there's a great multitude that are being saved. My, 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 could we ask for anything more loving and wonderful than that? And so when people are saying, well, you don't know the time where you, uh, uh, you uh, prove it to us from the Bible and so on, I don't know what they're thinking about. Don't they want to know if they could? Aren't they recognizing that this is a an aspect of the love of God? Uh, uh, do they want God to be mean and hateful and, and, and just ruthlessly end it all and, and, uh, and the whole human race finds itself in, in the day of judgment with all the horrors that go with it? My, my, don't they recognize that this is a wonderful blessing of God? that he has given us this kind of information and given us these proofs uh, that show that indeed we're, uh, this is very accurate. Well, thank you for sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Mr. Campy. Yes. My question tonight is um, I'm struggling with alcoholism, and um, I just would like to know your opinion. Do you think that's a spiritual weakness, a physical weakness, or both? Well, it's a sin. You see, the problem is that, and of course it, it ends up as a physical weakness or a, spirit, or a spiritual weakness, but in actuality, we all serve a God. Everybody does. Even the atheists, their God is that as uh, their own minds that they think that they know the, all the all the details of how the world came into being and so on. But everyone has a God uh, that we turn to. And when we are uh, not a child of God, when we are a child of God, who do we turn to in our need when we are depressed or when we're lonely or when we're whatever... Uh, we go to the Lord. That's why the Bible says, uh, uh, don't be anxious about anything, but with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, uh, come, uh, come, uh, come to the, come, uh, 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 with prayer and with thanksgiving, we come to the Lord. And the peace of God that passeth understanding will keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. But if Christ is not our uh, the the one that we're serving. We're going to serve someone else. The alcoholic has learned that alcohol is their god. They don't really look at it as their god, but that is their god, because they find that the moment they're a little bit uneasy or they're depressed or or uh, things are not going quite right or they want a little bit more excitement, a glass of beer or a glass of wine or a or, uh, some whiskey or whatever will help them along. And, of course, if one glass 
does this much good, then a second glass should do better, and then about the third glass they lose uh, control, and they and the next thing they're under the table. Uh, so it's it's simply that alcohol is their god. The same is true with nicotine. And if we're a slave of anything, there are people for whom food is their god. They find that they are, are, are can't really face life adequately. Uh, but that piece of cake in the refrigerator, that really helps matters for the moment, and so on. And uh, the food it becomes, uh, the, that's why the Bible talks about gluttony. That also becomes a god. Or it can be sexual pleasure. Or it can be a hundred uh, different things. It can be some other kind of a drug. Everybody has some place where they can turn to when they need a little bit of help. And when we become a child of God, then we repudiate all these other other gods and we recognize there's only one God, and that is the God of the Bible. And we come and we pray, Oh God, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy, and, and just lean back on His almighty arms. And we only do that if God has made us His child if he has actually given us a new resurrected soul so that we have this intense desire to serve him. So obviously I'm not a child of God as of yet because I have this addiction. Well, that's reality. And in other words, I don't like to go around and point fingers and say, this man is not a child, that man is not a child because of this or the other. But uh, it's wonderful when I hear somebody who is listening to the Bible and recognizing that uh, that uh, they do have a trust in alcohol or a trust in in their food or a trust in 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 whatever it may be or in their church or in their creeds or or there, it can be a thousand different things and you can't serve the Bible says you can't serve. God and mammon, you can't serve, you can't have two gods, you can only serve one. And, and when a person comes to that realization, then they will make their own admission, I know I'm not a child of God. I know that I'm in deep trouble with God. But then comes the wonderful news that God is still saving. And we can go to God in our weakness, in our uh, in our bankruptcy, our spiritual bankruptcy, and cry out, Oh God, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. I know I'm a sinner. I know I've been serving a wrong kind of a God. And Oh Lord, have mercy. Could it be that I might become thy child? Oh Lord, will you begin to work in me a desire to do your will? And just keep at it. Keep at begging God, begging God, begging God waiting upon him because that is the biblical way and we maybe as there's a possibility that God will have mercy that is the, the that is what the bible teaches thank you sir have a good night thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum Brother Kaplan yes good night sir thank you so much for taking my call I, I really want to thank you so much for your, your, your ministry, and I've been really getting a lot, a lot of spiritual experience from it. I thank you so much, and keep on doing your good work, sir. Um, can you please explain to me um, Daniel 8, um, verse 14 to 17, and I will take my answer off the air, please. Daniel 8, 14 to 17. Yes, yes Daniel answer. 8. There we read... Um, let's start with verse. We have. Let's get the context. Uh, 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 it's talking about a little horn in verse ten, verse nine, and that little horn actually is a figure. A point. It's pointing to Satan, who will be the the ruler over the world during the first twenty three hundred days after the end of the church age and will continue 
uh, to rule in all the churches and to some degree in the world all the way to the end of 23 years or 8,400 days, which is the period of great tribulation. And that's what this passage is talking about. We read in verse 11, He magnified Himself even to the Prince of the Host. The Prince of the Host is Christ. And by Him the daily was taken away, the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of His sanctuary was cast down. In other words, Satan has come to rule in the churches. We know from other passages, like when we read Ezekiel uh, 29, that God actually placed him there. This is all part of God's end-time program as he's preparing the world for Judgment Day. And then it says, A host was given him against the daily by reason of transgression, and it cast down truth to the ground, and it practiced and, and he pra- practiced and prospered. And that host that was given to him are all the churches, as, as we read in, uh, uh, as we uh, read in Ezekiel 29. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain one which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation? to give both the sanctuary and the host, that is, the churches, to be trodden underfoot. And, he, and uh, the, the, not only the churches, but the gospel itself. And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, and actually in the original language, in the Hebrew language, it's 2,300 evening and mornings. It's very similar to the language of Genesis chapter 1, where it says there was evening and there was morning day 1. So we're, we're, we're reassured that this is talking about literal days. Later on in verse 26, God says, The vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true. Wherefore, thou uh, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. In other words, God is underscoring. It's 2,300 literal days. that We can gather that from this kind of language. And then it says, uh, 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 And he said, Unto 2,300 evening mornings, Then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And now that cleansing of the sanctuary, that has to do with the fact that God again is going to be bringing the gospel, although he's not going to cleanse the sanctuary that is that identifies with the local congregations. That's going to remain right to the end of 23 years rather than 2,300 days. It's 23 years or 8,400 days. And then it goes on, uh, and it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning, then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man, and I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand. And Gabriel here, I believe in the Bible, when we see the name Gabriel here or there, it's really referring to Christ himself, even as Michael is referring to Christ himself. Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of this end shall be of the end will be the vision. And you see, that's where we are, right at the end. That's why we can be assured that that 2,300 days has something to do with right at the end. And indeed, it factors in perfectly into the other language that we find that brings us finally to May 21, 2011, at the end of the very end of the, uh, or the time when the, the day of judgment begins to take place and the rapture takes place. But thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Keep up your good work. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. 
Hello? Yes, welcome to Open Forum. Hi, um, thank you very much for taking my call. And um, the caller earlier, you know, was making several comments, and um, he mentioned something about, you know, when you were telling people to get out of the church, you thought they would get out in droves, but that's okay because many are called, few are chosen. Right. And I used to be in the church, and I got out, and it wasn't because I he heard hear it from you. Well, it's I, because I, of experience. Yeah, excuse me. You know, I'm glad you mentioned that because I never did a teach that the people would get out in droves. That's his. Of that's course what he, not. That's what he wants to say. Of course not. Right, and right. I'm glad I heard you mention something at the starting of your program about truth. None of us. As human beings, we talk about the truth, but it's hard sometimes for us to digest. And I'm glad that you have such composure, you know. And um, about the, the, the orderliness of the call, yes, people have to realize that they need to uh, make sure what they want to ask and get it with it because this is an open forum for everyone. So let me um, go to what I want to ask you about with that being said. Isaiah 54. Isaiah 64, let's look. 54, 54, 54. 5, 4. Isaiah 54, there we, in which verse? Uh, the beginning. I read this so many times, but I want to ask you, sir, is, is it talking about a woman per se or, you know, Israel itself? Could you explain that to me? Let's, let's read a couple of verses. Right. It's, it's sing, sing, O barren. Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith Jehovah. Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes, for thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame, for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and shall not remember the reproach of thy widowhood any longer. For thy Maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, and a wife of youth, when thou wast refused, saith God, for a small moment have I forgotten thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. Now, actually, God is not talking about a woman. He's not talking about national Israel either. Uh, he is talking about all those who would become believers throughout the world, beginning with the church age. Although throughout the church age, the number that did become saved was relatively small quite small. It was typified by national Israel all through the 1480 years that God was featuring national Israel until the time of Christ. Uh, the number at any time was very small that did become saved, and that was a an earthly picture of the 1955 years of the church age where also it was a relatively small number that did become saved, although those that did become saved were the bride of Christ. And uh, they, uh, uh, therefore they are called a woman. And the, uh, uh, but it's in our day uh, when, we, when, when, we're, when God is finishing his work of salvation that, this, that, uh, that now... He is really saving a great many in comparison with what he had been saving uh, in the days of Israel or in the days of the church age and, and getting the whole world prepared for Judgment Day. But thank you for calling. In other words, this is a very rich passage in, in order to really 
or get the, the full meaning of it, we have to have in our mind's eye that God's whole plan, beginning with national Israel, then particularly going through the church age when the gospel went out into all the world, and then finally focusing on our day. But shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, my question is in Genesis 6, verse 13. Genesis 6, verse 13. Let's look at that. There we read. Uh, and God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Now, what is your question? Now, God meant uh, only the face of the earth there. So my question is, when he speaks of the new earth, can he be speaking the same way he talks to the true believer about a new heart? Oh, no. Uh, uh, excuse me, I'll get into that. That's a good question. I'll get into that right after Thank this you. message. You know, when we look at the language of Genesis, and God is speaking about the uh, first destruction, uh, worldwide destruction, we wonder, is that giving us a clue as to how we're to understand the language when God talks about the uh, the this coming destruction of the earth. Now let's let's look at this. In Genesis chapter six, he says in uh, verse thirteen, uh, the end of all flesh is come to me before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And if we didn't have any more information than that, we might think, well, now, what does that mean, that the earth is going to be destroyed? And then he said, he may, uh, indicated, build an ark, and get into the ark, and that way you're going to be saved. That already implied that, uh, that the earth was not going to disappear. It's not going to be ended, because that ark is, is, uh, is not going to be destroyed. And that ark is is made out of things of this earth and, and floats on the water that's going to come. And so he also said in verse 17, Behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. And... Uh, and uh, then we we learn about how all that went, and finally after after uh, 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 after uh, 375 days, the the earth came to an end. I, I didn't have that quite accurate, but close to that. Okay, a year. We, 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 actually, it was 370 days. I'm sorry. Now here's the language that God is using now. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. That's judgment day. And he's coming as a thief in the night for those who are still in spiritual darkness who don't want to recognize the wonderful blessing and love of God in that he has given us uh, the, spe the specific time of his coming. <laughs> they... Uh, they're missing a blessing, a man, an enormous blessing. He's coming as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that there are therein shall be burned up, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved what manner of persons ought we to be. Uh, and going on, verse 12, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. And so you can see the language is altogether different. This universe is going to be totally destroyed. It's going to be annihilated. It's, 
And that's why again and again, as we go through the Bible, we find statements like, I will make a full end. I will make a consumption, which is a way of writing a full end of, of, of this earth and of mankind on it. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, hi, Harold. I have some verses I'd like for you to read, and then after you read them, uh, just kind of tie them in for me, if you would, please. Uh, first one would be Ezekiel 7, uh, verses 1 through 10. Ezekiel 7, verses 1 to 10. There we go. Let's turn to that. Ezekiel 7. Moreover, the word of Jehovah came unto me, saying, Also, thou son of man, thus saith the Lord God unto the land of Israel, and end, that the end is come upon the four corners of the land. Now is the end come upon thee, and I will send mine anger upon thee, and will judge thee according to thy ways, and will recompense upon thee all thine abominations. Mine eyes shall not spare thee, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense thy ways upon thee, and thine abomination shall be in the midst of thee, and ye shall know that I am Jehovah. Thus saith the Lord Jehovah, An evil, and only evil, behold, is come, an end is come, the end is na- come. It watches for thee, behold, it is come. The morning is come unto thee, O thou that dwellest in the land, the time is come. The day of trouble is near, and not the sounding again of the mountains. Now will I shortly pour out my fury upon thee, and accomplish mine anger upon thee, and I will judge thee according to thy ways, and will recompense thee for all thine abominations. And mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. I will recompense thee according to thy ways, and thine abominations that are in the midst of thee, and ye shall know that I am Jehovah that smiteth. Now, what is your question? Okay, and then I'd like you to read Ezekiel 33, 1 through 6. Well, excuse me, what is your question about this? We've, had, we've read ten verses here. Uh, okay. What, 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 uh, what, well, what I, don't, I don't have a question. Moreover, I just wanted you to read it so that the people who are listening can hear uh, the anger of God and and why God uh, says that he's going to do this for them who don't know. And then I wanted you to read Ezekiel 33, 1 through 6, which explains why we have to watch and who the watchmen are and that it's their responsibility to yeah. tell the world about the day of the Lord. Yeah, well, you see, God here in Ezekiel is speaking in parables. Now, remember... In the New Testament, in Mark chapter 4, it says that Christ spoke in parables, and without a parable, he did not speak. And actually, Old Testament Israel was the earthly story. You remember the definition of a parable or a tableau. A tableau is a uh, three-dimensional picture that uh, identifies with a parable. There's an earthly story with a spiritual meaning. And in the Old Testament, God set up national Israel and their whole, all of his experiences with them, beginning with coming out of the land of Egypt and, and finally uh, going all the way through the time when Christ spoke, uh, when, when Christ came uh, and demonstrated how he paid for our sins. He is, he is uh, setting them up as the earthly story. Uh, but what is the spiritual meaning? They were a picture of the church age. All Everything that we read about national Israel in the Old Testament has a spiritual dimension pointing to God's 1955 years when he was dealing with the we deal with the churches. And so that's why as he's coming here, he's sounding like I'm ready to destroy you right now. 
Well, he wasn't ready to destroy Israel because they existed. To, uh, they they still exist today, but he it, it meant that the time would come when he would be finished with them. But he would also that would typify the fact that he was finished with with uh, uh, with uh, the church age. Now, a passage like. Ezekiel 18 or Ezekiel 3 or Ezekiel 33, those three chapters particularly underscore the fact that God has appointed someone as watchman and the only people who are going to be watching are the true believers because they have a tremendous desire uh, to learn from the Bible and it's a Bible that through which God teaches us truth. And so we learn about the timeline of this, and then we are to warn the world. And, in fact, we become the final uh, blessing of God in the world that we can tell the world, you know, you have two more years, and it's all over. And by God's mercy, you can still cry to God for mercy. But thank you for sharing, and shall we take our Thank next you. call? Guy, let's go to our next call. Please welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Kempin. Yes. Ezekiel 28, 13. Ezekiel 28, and which verse? 13. 13. There we read. Ezekiel 28, verse 13. Yes, sir. It's talking about Tyre. And mankind, son of man, uh, verse 12, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyre and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes were prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. And I have set thee so thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire, Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. Now, what is your question? Yeah, who prepared the tablets and the pipes for Satan? Because in verse 13, he's talking about Satan, right? Who prepared no, the, it is the not instruments to him? Uh, excuse me, there's theologian after theologian that has remarked and written paragraphs about this uh, chapter, and they've always been wrong. It is not Satan. Uh, Satan was not the anointed cherub. In fact, they start out with a principle that the Bible teaches that the cherubs and the seraphs were angels, and that is not possible when we see how God speaks about cherubs and, and seraphs. They have to do with God himself. And, and Satan was not created in the image of God. Mankind was created in the image of God and therefore could identify with a cherub. And it is mankind who was created perfect. Now, when it talks about the, the, the beauty, notice the, all the precious metal, all the precious stones, indicating the beauty of God's creation when mankind was created in the image and likeness of God. Of course, that means mankind was created super, super beautiful. Uh, and, and because of our sins, of course, we lost all of that. But then it talks about the tabrets, and the, uh, uh, and the, uh, the pipes were prepared in the, in the day that thou wast created. And you know, uh, from time to time in the Bible, God speaks about singing God's praises. We even read in, in Zephaniah where God himself sings. And uh, music is, 
and and remember we read in Colossians and and in I think in Ephesians where it says that addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. In other words, when God created mankind in the image of God, He created him with an ability to sing. Isn't it interesting how much music is involved in the lifestyle of mankind? Can you think of a world where there was no music, good, bad, or indifferent? No music. We can't even think about that. The fact is, music is a very big part. Now, of course, the music of our day, the secular music, does not bring praise and glory to God at all because it is, of course, focused on man and, and it's, it's in rebellion against God. But on the other hand, man was created to praise God through music. That's why, for example, on Family Radio, we're delighted that we have programs where we are where we can feature music that uh, that is being sung or played to the glory of God. In, in verse 13, where it said, Thou has been, I was looking to that word in the, in the original Hebrew, and the word means it created. Thou has been created. That's what it says. In, it's the word 1961 in the Hebrew. And I was comparing that with uh, Genesis 2, Seven, where in the same word what the Creator said, Genesis two seven, and the Creator formed man in the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and man became. That's the same word. In well, okay, man was. Uh, uh, can you explain that to me? Well, sure. Man was created. God, uh, God made man to be created means to, to be brought into existence. God created the animals also. God created the rocks and the trees and and planet Earth and uh, everything that has that that has that is involved with mankind uh, or with this universe was created by God. So that's not a surprising statement. It is simply saying that it is God who is the Creator. He none of it came into uh, existence by evolution or by long periods of time or anything else, it all was designed and uh, and uh, and brought into existence by the Word of God. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Camping, can we go to uh, Revelations eleven twelve, please? Revelation eleven twelve. There we read. May I read it, please? Re- 11, 12. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Now, what is your question? At that very moment? I'm sorry? That is the moment of the rapture, isn't it? At that moment? Let's look at this. They heard a great voice from, yes, come up hither. That is the time when the work of the believers is completed. Right. There's no more gospel to share. We've come to the last day of sending forth the gospel, which coincides with the, with the day of judgment, when right. God's judgment falls on the unsaved. Now, could we go to Revelation 9, 15, please? 9, verse 15. Yeah, I believe that I found a small mistake that you've made, although you very rarely make mistakes. i got to admit, you're an excellent Bible teacher. But you believe that there is 200 million that will be total saved, correct? Well, I say, when we look at this, first of all, look at verse 14. Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were... Now, the river Euphrates has to do with with the kingdom of God. It's not right. as dealing with Babylon. Right. If well, you if research you the take... Bible for a language that 
for, for those places where it talks about the river Euphrates, in, right. normally it is speaking about the farthest extent of the kingdom of God. It went from the river of Egypt to the right. river Euphrates. Right. Okay. Well, this, this now they're bound. Uh, they've been loosed. They, for an hour, a day, a month, and a year, to slay the third part of men. Now, right. The and, that's of, the, and those are the true believers. Correct. The four, the four angels, the two hundred million me, are true me. believers. The third part. Excuse me. The no, the, no, no, no. The two hundred million are the true believers. They yes. represent the true believers. Yes. Yes. Well, the one third of men. I believe are all those in the churches. You yourself said there's about one third that are in the churches. The 200 million are right now begging and pleading their family members to get out of the churches. This is how they will be slain by their testimony to them to get out of the churches because God's wrath is going to come upon them. If you read and it says by these three was the third part killed of no, men by fire. Me. Hey, excuse said, me, excuse me. We got to tie some other passages into this. We find in later on in Revelation it talks about Christ coming, riding on a white horse, and the armies of heaven following him, and a sword protrudes out of his mouth. That is, he's coming with the word of God, and and all of these. Uh, statements that deal with war or with a battle between the believers and the non-believers. You're correct, of course, that the one-third, which should have been the true believers, uh, uh, the one-third uh, throughout Revelation, they're under the wrath of God. They are the churches and congregations that are under the wrath of God. And But the, the war... There's not a physical war going on. It has to do with the confrontation and on the day of the rapture. Because as the people are being... That's when Christ comes with his, uh, with his uh, riding on a white horse and the armies riding on white horses, which uh, are spoken here also in Revelation 9. And they, the fact that... that uh, it's like when it says in Matthew, I think chapter 11, that the people of Nineveh will arise and condemn the uh, the, the peoples, the, the uh, these cities of of that day, uh, will condemn. Now these people, these people that died in uh, that were in Nineveh. They are living in their soul existence in, in heaven, and their bodies are being resurrected on the last day. But the fact that their bodies are resurrected is a, is a final testimony, a final condemnation against all those who had some other kind of a gospel, just like the, the resurrection of all the true believers at any time in history as well as the rapture of the true believers that are still living will be a condemnation a very big condemnation and condemnation is means that they're being uh, assaulted really uh, except it's not a physical assault it's totally spiritual that they are completely under the wrath of God and I believe that this is what this 200 million has to do with it is it is the the fact that that all of the believers are coming against the the uh, uh, are are showing the total bankruptcy of the churches that uh, they, uh, uh, so that they uh, it's it's typified by the language of a battle if you, if you go to second corinthians chapter or Second uh, Chronicles, rather, chapter 20. And you see the, there the battle between, uh, between uh, uh, Israel uh, and, and uh, Edom and Moab and Ammon. Now, Edom, Moab, and Ammon in the Bible uh, ordinarily typify the local congregations very definitely and of course Israel in that context typifies 
the true believers, and all, all, everyone of Edom and Moab and Ammon is slain. Not one survives. They're all killed. Then we read about how the battle went. And lo and behold, Israel is up on the cliff singing hymns of praise, and there not, there's not one soldier that is taking his spear out. And below there in the valley, uh, the valley of Jehoshaphat, that's called later on in the book of Joel, uh, the, the, because Jehoshaphat was king at that time, where they, the uh, Edomites and the Ammonites and the Moabites are killing off each other till there's not one left. And that is a portrait of of uh, when when it, we come to the time of the rapture that it is the uh, spiritually it will be the final end the final condemnation upon all of the those who thought they were believers and are left behind and now they're condemned by the fact that the true believers typified by the Ninevites are going into the safety of the arms of Christ. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes, good evening. <clears throat> Welcome to Open Forum. Do you think it's right for... <clears throat> I'm sorry. That's all right. Do you think it's right for uh, people who profess to be believers... Uh, to steal money from people who may not be not non-believers. Well, stealing is never right. I don't care be, be, who is doing the stealing. Uh, it's never right stealing. Thou shalt not. Uh, I, 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 we're, uh, that, that, that's contrary to the law of God altogether. What, I, what I'm saying is that people that are trying to. Uh, witness to me about God and Jesus Christ, and then uh, in some form uh, they steal things from me and take things away from me, or take monies that don't belong to them. I'm sorry, uh, I don't know how to answer you. If they're doing, if they're stealing from you, they are doing something wrong. And what you can do is go to the authorities, and if you can prove that they what, steal. What? What if they're doing it in a way that uh, you can't prove that they're doing it? Well, I have no idea what the situation is, and I'm certainly not qualified to make a judgment about that. But, but I would. I, uh, there's somebody that you could go to if you. Uh, there's somebody that you could get some help from if you. Uh, and, and you you must have some proof of some kind do, do they that fall? they're stealing from you. Otherwise. Otherwise, you have no case. You, you, they can't, you, can't, just, you can't just make a threat. You can't just make a, and, and claim they're stealing from me. You have to show uh, uh, how, what they're stealing and how they, how they stole from you and, and demonstrate this to, to someone that can help you. But I'm sorry, I can't help you anymore because we've come right to the end of our time until our next open forum. May the Lord richly bless you.